I want you to take the hand of someone near you. Our president has called a national day of prayer today for the victims uh, of the Texas flooding. And we just want to pray right now together. Just call on the name of the Lord for them. As a church, later in this service, I hope you stick around because Pastor Dale is going to talk about how we can not just pray for those victims, but also lend a hand to them. And we're going to talk about that a little later in our service. But right now, let's pray for them together. Father God, your word says to rejoice with those who rejoice, but to weep with those who weep. And, and today we stand in solidarity, not just with our congregation here, but with believers all around the world today who are calling on your name for those who have been affected by this terrible flooding. Lord, the southern United States, Lord, as we know, has, have gone through so many of these trials and situations. And our prayer now, God, is that you just energize and mobilize your church to be the hands and feet of Jesus to these people. God, I pray right now that you give us a passion and a desire, not just us, but the church of America, to be a help to the hurting. God, you give us that desire, Lord, to, to do like you said in Matthew 25, when, the, when we're hurting, when when we're in need, when we need clothing, when we need food, whatever. Lord, that help us to understand that when we, we meet the needs of others, we are actually ministering straight to you. God, I pray right now, Lord, not just that you would energize your church to touch these families and these lives, but I pray, God, right now that you would move upon them and bring them a peace that passes understanding. You would just wrap your arms around them and let them know that you're a good God even in bad situations. Let them experience your Holy Spirit. Let them understand, God, that the power of your Holy Spirit can bring comfort even in the worst and, and, and the most desperate times. We pray, God, that you bring restoration from the ruin and that you help them to trust you even when they can't trace you. God, even when it hurts, we're going to praise your name. Even someone here, Lord, they may not be in the Texas flooding, Lord, but it seems like the floodwaters are rising around their heart today. Bring comfort to them through your word as we open up its pages. In Jesus' name, the church said, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Why don't you turn around to somebody just for a moment, shake their hand, hug their neck, and just tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord today. Will you do that before you're seated? God bless you. He's here today. If you have a Bible with you or a device, I want you to turn to Psalm 3. And I'm reading today from the New King James Version. And maybe you ha didn't bring a Bible with you. That's all right. We're going to bring the scripture up on the screens today. If you're new here, my name is Pastor Jake. I'm one of the worship leaders here, the worship pastor, and one of the preaching team members. And we're just uh, honored that you've chosen to worship with us today. I'm bringing the word straight from Psalm 3. We're going to read the entirety of this chapter together. It's not a long chapter. And if you'd like, I would love for you, if you would, to just fix your eyes to the screen and, and read it out loud, if that's okay with you. I'd like for you to read it with me. Are you ready? Say yes if you are. All right. It says, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God Selah. And it says this, But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy heel, Selah. Then he says, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. And the church said, Amen, to the reading of the word of God today. I think it's interesting that the biggest book in the Bible is a book of songs. God must really love music. All throughout the Bible, you see music, you see songs. And even in the age that is to come, in the book of Revelation, we see that there's a lot of singing that's going on in heaven. It must be a thing. God must really love music. And music, like no other medium or power in the world, has the power to do so much with so little. I think you would agree that music can just affect your mood. It can affect your mindset. It can affect your attitude with just a few notes, with just a few chords. It's so intricate and detailed and complex. and It can affect your mood and your attitude. 
It's interesting because as complex as music is, and I know most of you are thinking, you know, when you hear singer, singer, or mu- mu- music playing, you're thinking, wow, that's very complex and intricate and interwoven. And, but honestly, 90-something percent of the music that you and I listen to, the vast majority of the music you and I hear in the Western world, can actually, the chords that make up that music, be categorized in two categories, major chords and minor chords. Major chords can be described as those bright chords that represent happiness and joy and laughter and good times. And the minor chords are often what we utilize to symbolize bad times and heartache and heartbreak and and despair and depression and gloom and, and, and even fear. In fact, if you were listening to scary movies and all the, the scary music that surrounds our, our, our scary movies, it's all in minor chord. D- the other day, someone on YouTube did a compilation of scary movie uh, s- clips and scenes, you know, some of those famous scary movie clips, and they took out the, the music. And it's really funny. I wasn't scared at all. I'm watching this. I'm like, huh, this is kind of funny. Without the music, it's not very scary. I mean, you watch Jaws without dun dun Dun, dun. It's, it's just a goldfish in there. Like, I'm not scared at all without the music. It's not scary anymore. It's almost, it's almost common. The music makes the emotion. Am I right on that? And But the interesting thing is that you can, you can categorize it all in majors and, and minors. And so those major chords, they represent joy and happiness. You know, uh, in the old church we used to sing, Oh Lord my God, when I am awesome, Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see some of you know that. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. I was singing on that t- uh, this week on the piano, and I thought, wow, that really wouldn't, really wouldn't sound right in a minor. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made. Wait, wait a second. That, uh-uh. It just doesn't go. The minor chord is a, has this ominous, and especially in our culture in the Western world, those minors symbolize the sadness and the, the brokenness of it. But you know, this is not anything new. You can go back a few hundred years ago in our, in the slaves, they, in, our, in our world, the slaves, before they were freed, and they would tap into the power of minor chords to express the anguish and the pain and the, and the sorrow that they would feel. And not long ago, I was, as I was preparing this message, I, I turned on the TV or on the computer, and I begin to hear this song. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. The Lord's gonna trouble the water. I said, man, that's sad. And I thought to myself, that just wouldn't make sense in that Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Now, then before you're really going through some tough stuff. But if you major it, if you make it a, ma- a major chord, you're just going fishing or something. You're, you're wading through that water. You're catching crawdads in that water. You ain't, you ain't trying to escape nothing. The minor brings the emotion to all of it. I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains of Kentucky, and we, we tapped into, uh, many of you Many of you know the southern United States. There's a lot of minor chords in our music. Um, growing up, my, my family would sing, I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger. I'm traveling through this world of woe. Toss or danger in that bright land to which I go. Man, those minor chords, it wouldn't make sense to, to major that, would it? 
And here's what's interesting. You would agree, I think everyone here would agree, that there's a big difference in the way a minor chord and the way a major chord would make you feel. If I go to C major, you'd say, man, that's a big difference than C minor. But do you know in music, it's only one major, one half step change. Three notes make a chord. Only one note changes the feeling of the song. Everything turns on that one note. So I begin to think about this this week. I begin to think about how many people in this room who one change, one phone call, one diagnosis, one decision by an employer, one betrayal, from a trusted loved one, one car crash, one wrong turn, one cell in the body gets loose, becomes cancerous, and everything changes from major to minor. How many of you could say, honestly, in this room today that you've had situations in your life where the music has gone from a major key to a minor key in your life, from from joy to sorrow, from happiness to pain, from rejoicing to mourning. Just like in music, we're just one half step away from completely changing the tonality of the song, so it is with us. We are one decision, we are one action, we are one small cell getting loose, we are one phone call, one wrong turn, one diagnosis, one decision from a boss. We are always one step away from the minor chords in life. You know, just... Not long ago, a couple years ago actually, on a September Saturday, everything was fine. A couple came to our church, Tim and Denise Rhodes, as they had done many times before. They were part of our congregation. It was Saturday night church, and here they were with their family, their daughter and their son, and Tim Jr. was there with them, and they enjoyed worship here on a Saturday, and they went home, and they had dinner, and they went to bed, and everything was fine. And then later that night, late in the, eve- late in the night, Tim and Denise were awakened by a knock on the door, and it was a police officer telling them that their son, Tim Jr., who was here with us in church, had had been in a fatal car accident, and he lost his life. Just like that, from major to minor in their life. Just like that, they went from rejoicing to weeping, from glory to sorrow, from happiness to despair in a moment in time. You know, Kristen and I, my wife, she was singing up here uh, just a few moments ago in the worship team, and as she was singing, even when it hurts, I was thinking about Tim and Denise and how we went, Kristen and I went to that funeral and Tim and Denise sat on the front row of that, of that funeral and their eyes full of tears and their hearts broken with the loss of their son. But yet, as we sang songs, as we began to praise, as we began to praise God, their hands would go in the air. And the song, their voice, I could hear them singing from that front row. And I was just in shock as I looked and I said, God, I want a faith like that. I want to be able to keep a major chord attitude when the minor chords are struck in my life. I want to be able to say, God, even though my situation is bad, I know that you are good. I want to be able in my heart to say, you know what, this is my complaint before the Lord and this is what really, really sucks about life right now. Can I say that as a preacher? It's okay? It's all right? This this is what really bothers me, God. This is my complaint. But I don't want to stop there. I want to have a moment in my life where my perspective shifts and where something changes. And when I see people like that, I think about David in Psalm 3. And most of us, as we read that scripture that we just read, you just read it as a scripture. But you know there's a story behind the song. There's always a situation behind these songs that you see in the, in the book of Psalms. You know, it's kind of like a Taylor Swift song. There's always a beef or a boyfriend or a breakup, you know, somewhere in behind that song. I've often thought to myself, I, I'm glad I never dated Taylor Swift because I would end up on a song. And if, I could get her if I wanted to, but I don't want to end up in the lyrics to a song, right? I don't want to be that guy. There's always a story behind the song. And if you really understand the situation behind the song of Psalm 3, it changes your perspective on how you read it. Because David was going through a pretty tough time. First, I want to talk about the conception of this situation. And you have to go all the way back to 1 Samuel 11. 2 Samuel 11, I'm sorry. And find out what the situation behind the song was. Let's read this together. I want to show you what was really happening in this time. 
It says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. Stop there. David's the king. He's supposed to go off to war. Instead, he stays home. I could stop there and preach an entire sermon on what happens when fathers say no to their responsibilities. But I'm not going to do that because that's a whole other sermon. Let's keep going. So, the whole Israel, they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. It's important for you to understand that bathtubs were on the roof. The king's palace was the highest peak, and he could look down and he could look upon the rooftops of those around him. Dave, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Whoever this guy was right here, he was the guy who, who you have at your side all the time who's always like, bro, she's married, okay? She's married, bro. You guys, anybody ever had a friend like that who's always keeping you in check? That's who this was. He was keeping David in check. Bro, she's married. David said, you know what? I know I'm the king. I know that God has said that I have to follow him. I have to do what he says. I have to follow in God's law, but I'm not going to do that. I want that woman. It says David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. You understand that that was an action that had consequences because God's covenant with David was dependent upon David choosing to keep his moral law. As the king, he had the responsibility to do what was right. And when David chose to do what was wrong, then God stepped back and said, if you're going to go that direction, I'm going to go this direction. My friend, I've come to tell you, you cannot just do whatever you want with your life and expect God's blessing to be upon you. We have a responsibility to see his word and to trust the Holy Spirit to, to lead us into obedience to that word. Now, I know it's not popular, and we want to just say, grace, God's gracious. I can jump into any pool of sin and muck and mire that I want. But the truth is, God has bigger and better things for you. When we choose to live our lives the way we want to and to act on our own flesh and sin and wants and will, we can expect consequences to those actions. What David did as he stepped into adultery, his family life began to go bananas. Everything went in disarray in, in David's home. First, his son Amnon raped his half-sister Tamar. Then, his other son Absalom, out of vengeance, killed Amnon and fled as an exile from prosecution. So here's David, the adulterer, and the whole kingdom knows that he's committed adultery. And he's supposed to be the respected sweet psalmist of Israel, the one who plays his harp and... Demons tremble, and he's, he's, he's humiliated. He had a baby with Bathsheba, and that baby died. I didn't even get to that story yet. His son kills his other son after the son rapes his daughter. So he has one son who's dead, another son who's in exile, a daughter who's at home who's broken and alone. And here's David who desperately needs a visit with Dr. Phil because this family situation is gone bananas I don't know what you're thinking. Wow, I thought my family was crazy. I don't even, I'm not even going to get into this. Everything in David's life was falling apart. This was the situation behind the song. But then it escalated. In music, we call it a crescendo. Everything got a little bit quiet. You know, things were bad. Things were going. Things were going, but a crescendo is when the music comes to a, a build. Absalom gets home from his exile and his running away from prosecution. And he wants to come home to his dad and find protection from the king. But the king says, daddy says, I don't want to see my son. Get him out of my sight. He killed Amnon. I don't want to see him. This rejection, David decided one decision after the other. He pushed Absalom away and then hatred and bitterness began to set up in the, in the heart of Absalom. Absalom said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to steal the kingship from my dad. I'm going to go into the kingdom and as the king's son, he already had respect among the people. I'm going to steal away the hearts of the people and get people to trust in me as the king. So, so Absalom became a politician. He began to go to people and say, tell me what situation you have. And they'd say, well, I'm in a lawsuit with my brother uh, because he did this. Well, if I, were, if I were the king, I would rule in 
your favor and I would give you the money and I would give you the inheritance and I wouldn't give it to your brother. He would go and he would play both sides of the fence. He was just a perfect politician. We, do this, we fall for this all the time. If you elect me as president, I'm going to give you the best health care. We're going to get health care, and it's going to be health care for the ages, and it's going to be tomorrow I'm going to get it done. And we're like, woo, yeah. They're just politicians. They just tell us what we want to hear, right? You know this. We all know this. Politicians are politicians. That's exactly who Absalom became, a politician. And he stole the hearts of the people away from his father and onto himself. Now, all of a sudden, hundreds of thousands of people have decided we're going to follow Absalom. We're not going to follow David anymore. He's our king. The escalation and the crescendo of this can be seen in 2 Samuel 15 and 12. It says the conspiracy gained strength and Absalom's following kept on increasing. Thousands of people began to reject the king. So this became so violent and so dangerous that the king, crown on his head, scepter of sovereignty in his hand, robe on his back, has to come down off of his throne, out of his palace. His son moves into the palace. David takes what little generals and captains and army that he has left, and he's running for his life from his own son. Could it get any worse than this situation for David? Commits adultery, family troubles. His own son has left him. And then he's running for his life. And all of a sudden, this cat named Shimei comes out of his house and says, Hey, David, God's forsaken you. And so when you look at this, I want you to look at what David said. He said, Lord, many are they who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. What David was saying was, This situation is bigger than me. This was his complaint before the Lord. And I want you to notice that before David went to generals and counselors and before he went to friends and family and Facebook and Twitter, before he went to Dr. Phil and Oprah, he went straight to who? The Lord. My friend, I want to tell you that there's a whole lot of answers waiting for you that you fail to get because you're going to the wrong sources of information. Before you run to anyone else, run to the Lord. David with his heart broken, David with pain, David going through this adversity, he said, Lord. We used to sing a song in the old church, oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Lord, how have they increased to trouble me? Many there be who say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. Do you understand what David was doing here? Was laying out his complaint before the Lord. He was saying, I am broken, I'm surrounded, everything's going wrong in my life. And as I look out here today, I know what you're thinking. You know, you can't relate to a kingdom turning on you. You can't relate to to a son leading a revolt against you. You really can't relate to a king who's having to watch over his shoulder and who has all of this going on in his home. I understand that. But as I preach to you today, I know some of the stories in this room and watching online. I know some of the pains and struggles that people go through in this room. I know that you know exactly what it's like to have your world turned upside down by one phone call or one decision or one diagnosis or one financial catastrophe or one problem, one emotional scar, one moment of abuse. You know exactly what it is to go through the minor chords of life. You know what it is to feel that heaviness sitting on you. The pain and the heartache that you're going through in your life. You know what it is to feel that, but my friend, I want to tell you it's possible for you to get to a place in your life where you have a major chord praise on your lips while you're walking through a minor chord problem in your life. I'm going to say that one more time in case you didn't get to Twitter fast enough. It is possible for you to have a major chord praise on your lips while you're walking through a minor court situation in your life. I want to tell you something happened to David. For he said, this is my complaint. This is what's wrong. Do you know God is not afraid of you telling him how you feel? Did you know there is absolutely nothing wrong with going to God and saying, hey God, this situation really stinks in my life right now. He's not afraid of that. He's not offended by your complaining, but my friend, there's got to be a change. You see, we talked about the situation, and, 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 but now I want you to see that there's something that begins to happen in this story. There's a little word called Selah. Will you say it with me? Just shout Selah. 
What is a Selah? What is it? Here's what Spurgeon said. This is a musical pause, the precise meaning of which is not known. Some think that it's a rest, a pause in the music. Others say it means lift up the strain, sing more loudly, pitch the tune upon a higher key. But the very next words that we see from, from David is indicative that he's about to change the tone of the song. He's about to change the direction of the music. He's about to go from complaining about his situation to confessing things about his Savior. In between complaint and confession, there was a Selah. There was this moment of pause and stopping and recalibrating and rethinking this thing where he changed his mind about his circumstance. There was this moment where everything shifted and that's what I'm praying this service is for you today is a say law. It's a pause. It's a time for you to stop everything and say, you know what? I'm just going to press the pause button. I'm going to quit saying what I've been saying, thinking what I've been thinking and complaining the way I've been complaining. The time has come today for me to shift my focus from my, from my problem to my solution from my pain to my healer, from my disease to the deliverer, I'm going to have a say law right now where I say I'm refusing to let this thing get the best of me in this moment right now. I've lived in a minor chord long enough, and it's time for me to hit the pause button, have a moment where I say my God is greater than my situation right now in this moment today. Lord, I prayed this prayer this week, and I wrote it down. As a poem, Lord, fix my eyes so I can see your will is working out in me. Lord, let me stop and see what's true, that all my pain is known by you. We can't deny that the minor chord exists. It's there. The situation's grim. The situation is real. There's problems. There's pain. There's stuff in all of our lives that sound like a minor key. But my friend, I've come to tell you it's time to change the tune. It's time to have a say law. It's time to shift your focus because David went from the situation to the say law to the song of praise, the major chord of praise. First he's saying, Lord, this is what's wrong. But next he says, but Lord, you are a shield for me. You are my glory and the one one who lifts my head. I cried to the Lord and he heard me out of his holy hill. I will lay down and sleep. I will awake for the Lord sustains me. Surely it's the Lord that breaks the teeth of my enemies. What he began to do is make confessions about the reality of his God that countered the reality of his problem. My friend, here's what I want to tell you. Most of us spend much more time confessing what's wrong than confessing the power of God over our lives. I want to just tell you this right now, that David began to make proclamations about God that built faith in his heart for his situation. I'm going to tell you in this place right now that if you'll start bragging on who God is in your life, it will shift your focus from the perplexity and the, and, the, and the dilemma and the problem. It will begin to build faith in your heart and you'll be able to see that God is far greater than all of these things. One man said, instead of telling God how good your mountain, or how big your mountain is, start telling your mountain how big your God is. Start bragging on the fact that God is in control, that all things are in in his hands and that he has not left your side. What did he say? Lord, you're a shield for me. The actual Hebrew translation says, you're a shield all around me. You know, that was unheard of in those days. They didn't have shields that surrounded you. The shield was in front protection. It protected your heart. It protected your face. David said, no, he's a sovereign shield. How long has it been since you said, Lord, I want to just crawl up in your arms and I want you to wrap yourself around me like a shield and protect me from all of this. Keep me from all of this. He said, Lord, you're a sovereign shield, but he didn't stop there. He said, but you're a glory giver and a loving lifter. Here the king who was in the palace is now the peasant in a pit. The, the one who was royal sitting on a throne is now on the run. The one who had a robe on his back is now come to ruin. The one who sat lofty every Everything was fine in major chords is now in the minor keys. But he said, Lord, I know you're the one who can lift up my brokenness, who can lift up my heart and head. My friend, I've come to tell you, and don't get me wrong, because I believe in doctors and medication and all of that. Don't get me wrong. But there's a whole lot of people who are running to the wrong sources for a lift, for a pick-me-up. We want to run to drinking. We want to run to the drugs. We want to run to the affair. We want to run to the friends. We want to run to the party. We want to run to all these things to try to lift us up, and they only leave us feeling more depressed and lonely and down 
down than we ever did before, instead of running to the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, instead of running to the altar, instead of running to Jesus, he's the one who can lift up your head. He's light in the darkness. He's peace in the midst of the storm. He's hope for the hopeless. He's joy in the sorrow. He's help when you're helpless. He's the only lifter that you truly need. He's a restorer of glory. And then he began to say, here's what he gives me. He gives me peace that puts me to sleep. Let me ask you, how's your sleep? How's that ambient working out for you? So I want to tell you, I know there's genetic problems, but I want to tell you that God can give you a sleep that's only produced by the peace of God that passes understanding. When I see families going through minor key situations in their life, but yet they're sleeping like babies because the Holy Spirit's moving in their life, I hear Jesus saying, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. By how? How will they be comforted? By the peace of God that wraps up your soul. God's going to do that for somebody in this room today. He's going to give you a sleep tonight that you've never experienced. And then he began to brag on what God did in the past. He said, the Lord has broken the cheekbones of my enemies. In the past, the Lord has, has broken the teeth of the enemy. If you are in this room today and you need reminded for your present pain, the past experiences, I just want to tell you, look back over your life. And I promise you, if you'll just take a glance back you'll see that God's been with you all the time that there's been all sorts of things he's brought you through that time and time again he's walked you through the valley and I just want to make an announcement this morning if he brought you through that he'll bring you through this if he walked you through that problem he'll bring you through this predicament because he's the same God today the situation was grim. The Selah was a turning point his song of praise directed his attention to God but for you and I, how do we tap into the power of victory in our minor keys in our life? Well, the answer is always for us, Jesus, the Savior. Situation's bad. The say law is the turning point. The song of praise is the minor key of praise in the midst of a minor key, uh, major key of praise in a minor key situation. But the Savior, the Son of David, is the one who comes in, into your heart and your life and makes this victory a reality to you. You see Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Jesus, the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of who? David. You know, Jesus was from the lineage of David. But when I see David... In this Psalm 3 situation, I see Jesus at the end of his life going through something very similar. I see Jesus surrounded by enemies just like David was surrounded. I see Jesus in, the, in those movies in my mind. I can see Jesus standing in the middle and thousands of people surrounding him, wanting him to die. David betrayed by his son by his generals and by his friends. But Jesus, in Luke 22, he said, Judas, you betray me with a kiss? I see David crying out, Lord, many are they increased that trouble me. But I see Jesus, in the book of Matthew 26, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground. And he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Let this suffering pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Can you see that the greater than David came? That Jesus came. And he went through a, 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 sit, a minor chord situation worse than David ever dreamed of going through. That Jesus lived in the major chords for three and a half years. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. All was well. Major chords. But on that faithful night in the garden, when Judas kissed him, everything changed and Jesus' situation turned from a major to a minor chord. If you're in the shoes of the disciples, you're looking at this whole thing, and the minor chords are so loud, you can't hear any other music. Because you see the disciples rested all their hopes and all their dreams and everything they had on Jesus, and now Jesus is dead, and there's nothing but a say law. There's nothing but a silence and a rest that's come over everything. Day one, say law, nothing, hopeless, abandoned, and afraid. Day two, say law, there's obviously not going to be a turnaround here. We might as well pack up and go home. Peter, James, and John are looking at each other saying, what are we going to do? 
two, our lives are over, it's only minor chords. Day three, a couple women get up in the morning and say, let's go to the tomb and just let's just go pray and let's go anoint his body. Let's go spend some time at the tomb. But the closer they got there, walking in their darkness in their minor key situation, the music began to change the closer they got to the tomb because they saw that there was a stone that was rolled away and there was a light that was shining from in there and there was a voice that was speaking. And after three days of a Selah, Jesus came forth out of the grave with power and great glory. And he said, I'm about to shift the music in your life. I'm about to bring a change to everything in your life. My friend, I've come to tell you that Jesus is the one by faith in him. He can take your minors and make a major. He can take your pain and give you a praise. He can take your situation and give you a song of praise because Jesus is the son of David, the one who takes it all. Spurgeon said this. How blessed to know. I love this quote. One of my favorite quotes. Oh, how precious to know and believe that Jesus has routed the host, trodden them down in his anger. They who would have troubled us, he has removed into captivity. And those who would have risen up against us, he has laid low. The dragon lost his sting when he dashed it into the soul of Jesus. So you place your faith in Christ today. Fresh a new, maybe for the first time, you put your faith fully in Jesus and the God of David, the shield, the lifter, the glory giver, the peace provider, the listening Lord, the one who's sovereign over you. You put your faith in Jesus and the God of David becomes your God. And the victory of David becomes your victory. And the perspective of David becomes your perspective because you see, you can't do this in and of yourself. This is not the power of self-help. This is not me telling you to pull yourself up from your own bootstraps and somehow get through. This is not me telling you just have a good mindset, just change your mind and think good and you'll get through it. No, this is me telling you that we must fall back and lay back on Jesus, that we must depend on Jesus because he alone is the strength provider for the pains of our life. We got to put our weight on him. We got to trust in Jesus. Whatever your situation is, whatever the minor chords are in your life, whatever the problem that plagues you. And you know, I was shocked as I looked out in this crowd in Saturday and first service and I said, I want you to raise your hand if you're going through a minor chord situation. I was shocked at the hands that went up. People with tears falling down their eyes. My friend, I want you to know that God knows your pain. There's one thing that unites all of us together. You know what it is? Pain. The minor chords. We all feel it. Right now, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to bow your heads. And I want you to begin to pray with me. Because there's people in this room right now who are walking through the minor chords in your life. The music has been struck. You don't know what you're going to do. But God's there for you. He hears you. He knows right where you are. And God is telling you today, trust me. Trust me. Trust me. The word trust literally means to put your full weight upon. It means to sit down upon. Some of you walked in here today and you walked, sat down on a chair. You didn't even think about if that chair could hold you up. You just put all your weight on that chair. You trusted that that chair was going to hold you up. That's what trusting in Jesus is all about. I want every person in this room major or minor in your life, whatever, I want you to stand to your feet right where you are. And I want to ask you a very specific question while your head's bowed and eyes are closed. If you can say that the minor chords of life were once struck in your heart, but God brought you through it and brought a major chord victory, would you lift up your hand and say, yep, I've had a few situations like that. I know I can. I know I've been there. I could tell you some things now that would just shock you and amaze you. Now, with every head bowed, every eyes closed, I want you, those of you right now that the music of your life, if I were to put music to your life right now, it would be set in a minor chord. Would you lift up your hand and say, that's me, I'm going through that darkness, I'm going through that kind of pain right now. I'm going through that situation, God bless you. God bless you, there's so many of you. You're walking through that minor chord, my friend, I wanna tell you, God is with you. He hasn't forsaken you. He hasn't abandoned you. You're not alone in this thing. But he's going to bring strength to you. What we're going to do in this place today is we're going to fix our attention and our affections and our emotions and our will on the Lord in a season of worship. 
I want all of you who are living in the minor chord right now to just get up out of your seat and come stand up here in the front, all across this front. Get as close as you can and spread absolutely as wide as you can. I want you to do it right now. Everyone who's walking in the major keys right now, everything's fine. You're rejoicing in the Lord right now. You're praising God for victory. You're praising God. I want you to get out right now. We're all going to come up here together. We're all going to come on. Come on. Just make your way. You, Everyone who raised your hand, just come on up here. I'm not going to do nothing crazy to you. We're just going to praise God together, all right? I'm going to throw no anointing oil on you or knock you down on the floor or anything stupid or anything weird. Don't worry about it. Just, just come on up. Take a minute. Now, I want all of you who are in the minor chords, I want us all to flow together. Come on, let's all come together. Maybe you're in the minor chords of life. I want us to, to come together as a church in unity in this altar because we're about to sing a song together. We're about to give God praise. All of us. Can, can you all come? Maybe you're back there saying, I'm somewhere in the middle. You come too. Husband, grab your wife. Let's all come up to the front. Guys, come as close as you can and spread as wide as you can. Up in the balcony, we invite you to come down. I know it's a long walk, but it's all right. It'll be worth it. Why am I doing this? Because there's just power in movement. When we move and when we trust and when we sing together, there's just something great. I want you guys to go as far that way as you can to the wall, and we'll fit everyone in if we go as far to the walls as we, as we can. As far as we can go, we'll do that. We're about to sing the song. Here's what I want you to do. This is not an exercise in futility. This is a moment for us in unity as a church, in concert. We are going to praise. We're going to do what David did. And we're going to praise despite our predicament. We're going to worship despite our problems, despite whatever's going on in our life. We're just going to say, God, I'm going to lift my voice. I'm going to lift my hands. And I'm going to sing it to you. I'm going to pray this prayer. And when we say amen, we're going to lift our voices and sing together. Let's pray. Father God. We call on your name because we know that you and you alone are the giver of strength. You're the giver of victory. You're the giver of glory and honor. You restore our hearts that are broken. Lord, we feel today, Lord, pain, minor chords in our, in our families, in our nation, in our world. We, we hear the music of the minors today. But God, in this moment, we're having a say law. We're going to pause right now. We're just going to think on you and how great you are and what you did for us on the cross how you bled and how you died. And in view of the cross, with our hearts fixed on what you did for us on that cross, we're going to turn that into praise and worship. And through praise and worship, we're going to allow your Holy Spirit to touch us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Now, this is we're not going to spectate. We're going to worship. So let's put our hands in the air, focus our attention on Jesus, and through your worship, God's going to bring strength to you. Sing it. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength Let him touch your heart. indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Just through the avenue of worship, as you praise, his Holy Spirit's going to strike the major chords in your heart. Sing it out, Lord, now. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Every voice, Jesus paid. Jesus paid it all All to Him Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in Him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Come on, just worship his name, Jesus. Jesus paid him all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow.
up your name. This is our Selah. This is our moment where we pause and we say, God, the problem's great. The cross was bad, but the tomb says there's victory for me. The minor chord shifts to the major chord. And with all my heart and with all my soul, I lift up my voice to say, oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. I'm not going to stay in that minor chord. I'm going to live in the major praise right now. Lift it up. My goodness, that was great to hear y'all. It's great to be down here, hearing everybody yelling, <laughs> praising the same breath that he gave you, giving it back to him, thanking him that even in the midst of the majors and the minors that many of you are walking through right now, he can still live and breathe and work through us. I'm going to ask you to do me something. As you head back to your seats, shake someone's hand, look them in the eyes, tell them what God's done in your life. Tell them God's done amazing things in your life. While we're here praising, while we're here thanking God, I'm going to ask you to do what, what Jake told us to do a little earlier. We prayed. We prayed for those that are down in Houston and South Texas and Louisiana, those that are getting hammered. And we're going to do something more than that. Um, some of you may know something kind of interesting happened this week that doesn't always happen. Uh, yesterday, uh, our president signed something uh, naming today a national day of prayer for the people and the flood victims in South Texas. So we're going to take time today as you leave, as you go home, continue to pray for the victims of Harvey, for the stuff that's going on down there. But I also think it's interesting. Sometimes we pray and ask God to do something and, and don't realize God's asking us to do what he wants us to do. So we're going to take part in that. Um, I used, many of you don't know, I used to be a college pastor in Nashville, Tennessee, and I uh, had a number of interns through the years that worked with me, and two of my interns, uh, one guy by the name of Matthew Hawkins. Matt is the senior pastor at First Church of the Nazarene in Houston, Texas. And one of my interns is, uh, another one of my interns is a pastor at, at the very aptly named Lake Houston Church of the Nazarene. Um, that's where he's pastoring. I was able to talk with them this week and just say, what's going on? How can, how can we help you guys? And uh, they said, well, right now, pray. Uh, we're not even set up to receive help. We don't have, they just got in a warehouse. Another guy from our church, George Sisler, 
is headed down there with our denomination, and he's setting up Nazarene Compassionate Ministries to be able to help uh, families and those who've been struck. And over the next few weeks, we're going to hear how we at Grove City uh, could be involved in helping in the rebuilding process and what's going to be going on down in Houston. And we'll let you know more about that. And in fact, this Wednesday night, right here at 7 o'clock, we already had scheduled a all-church prayer service. So our teens, our children, everybody's going to be in here. And we're inviting all of you to come and be in here. We're going to be praying about what God has for us to do as a future and as a church. And so we're going to be we're going to be talking about all that together. But we're also having people bring all sorts of things for what's the crisis care kits. Inside your weekly update, there's a little little card in there that's got information on what you can bring. Bring it throughout the week. We're going to be staging stuff so that while we're here, we're also going to put together crisis care kits that will be sent down to Houston, Texas. Um, our district all over Ohio has put together a few points where different churches are going to bring stuff to be shipped out. And Grove City Church of the Nazarene right here, the Naz, is a place where people are bringing all the stuff. We'll load up a semi-tractor trailer, and they'll be taking all that stuff down uh, to Houston within the next week or so. And so we'd ask you to get involved in that and be, be involved in seeing how we can help, not just pray about what's going on, but also to actually be the hands and feet of Christ of helping out over the next few months as, as recovery stuff happens. Isn't it great to be a part of a church that's, that's global and a church that sees things that are going on and says, how can we help? And I'm glad that you guys are a part of that kind of people. We're going to be able to do that. It's going to be awesome. Um, the ushers are going to come at this time. We're going to receive uh, the morning tithes and offerings. And then I've got a couple other things to tell you. Father, pray that you'd be with us this morning as we collect these tithes and offerings. You would help us, Father, to be your hands and feet. That as we, as we give back to you a portion of what you have given to us, that you would use us this week. Uh, Lord, use, use our hands, use our feet. Help us to see how we can help in Houston. But God, I pray that you'd help us to see how we can help right where we work, where we go to school, uh, where we go to the university. Lord, wherever we're at, that there are, are people around us <laughs> who are in the minor chords of life, that bad stuff's going on right here. God, I pray that you'd help us to be the ones that are able to share with them that one little shift, one little change, fixing our eyes on you, allowing you uh, to live and dwell in us can, can change the song in our life. God, use us to be your hands and feet today. All these things, Father, we ask and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. As the ushers are, are passing the plates, there's a little card that's in your weekly update right here that's got some information on it. And I'd like you to, everyone, take that card out real quick. Take the card. Whether you're a first-time guest, whether you've been here your whole life, take that card out. On the front, just fill out your name, your information, on the back, there's a place where you can let us know of your prayer requests, either for yourself or someone you would like us to pray for. Uh, if there's someone in the hospital, let us know that as well and just say you'd like them to have a visit and we'll go and visit them and spend time with them. But we want to pray over these. We take time to pray over these. This Wednesday night, everyone who's here will be praying over these cards, over these individual requests. This happens every week here at our church. These are vitally important to us. Uh, but there's also some space back there where you can let us know of different things going on in your life. You may today uh, have accepted Christ for the first time. Uh, you may not have known about what he could do in your life and his love for you, and you've accepted him as Savior. Or you may want to do that. There will be a couple of us up here following the service. And if you'd like to just bring that card, come on up to us. We've got something we'd like to give you to kind of help you on your walk with Christ as you continue to grow in him and help wait, find ways to get you connected. If you're a first-time guest, uh, we're so happy that you've chosen to visit with us. And on your way out the door, uh, as you go either to the right or the left, you'll see guest services signs. Stop by there. Take your card. We've got some, some gifts we'd like to give you and just find out how we can help you get connected. But one of the ways we get connected here at the NAS is through connection groups. And uh, starting next week, the new series that we're doing is called Starting Point. And it's an eight-week series helping us as Christians kind of, and those who are non-Christians, figure out what do I need to do in my life, what God's wanting to do. How many of y'all wish you could just have a do-over? <laughs> some, some are going, yes, this week I wish I could have a do-over. Um, watch the screens real quick as Andy Stanley talks to us a little bit about starting point. Everything has a starting point. You had a starting point. Faith has a starting point as well. For most of us, we began to believe something about God as children, and then we became adults, and it didn't work anymore. And there was this growing gap between what we were told as children and what we experienced as adults. Sometimes adults need a new starting point. So we're gonna hit the restart button. 
What if we'd never heard any of those stories? Where would we start? What if we didn't know anything? Where would we start? Because starting off with faith as a child is very different than starting off with faith as an adult. Would you stand with me? It's my hope that you'll come back next week. You'll be ready for this series, but also find a friend um, who may be knew Christ as a kid and wandered away and they're needing to start over again or someone who's never known Christ and they're needing a starting point as an adult. We're gonna have a great time together. If you'd like to join a connection group, not every connection group is doing starting point, but many are. There'll be some that are meeting on Sunday nights right here at the church, some that are meeting on Wednesday nights and some throughout the weeks at people's home, but let us know. I'd like to be a part of a starting point group so we can get you connected. As you go out, we'd love to bless you guys here before you go. So if you'd, if you'd hold your hands out, I'd like to give you a blessing before you leave here. It's my prayer that God will so fill your hearts and your lives this week. And for some of you that have had that minor chord struck, that you'll fix your eyes on him and he'll find a way of putting that back to a major chord. I pray that his Holy Spirit will so fill you that those who are around you would see the difference in your life and that you'd be able to talk to them about the music in your life and that, Lord, that they would be drawn to him as well. I ask these things in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in his grace and peace. Have a great week.